John Warner IV is an author, historian, with a passion for hidden history, revisionist historical narratives, vintage cars, and the unsung heroes of World War II. And all the profits from his books go to wounded veteran charities. Uh, John Warner is a skeptic about historical records, including textbooks. And for over 30 years, a perspective that's been well honed, his father is a five-term U.S. Senator John Warner III from Virginia was also the Secretary of the Navy and Chairman of the Armed Services Committee during the Vietnam War. His mother, Catherine Mellon, daughter of philanthropist Paul Mellon, was an activist who protested that war. She taught him to question authority, think independently, and speak his mind. Thanks to his family and his own dogged persistence, he's been behind the scenes with some of the most powerful and influential people in the U.S. and global history. In his historical novels, Little Anton and the new sequel, lion tiger bear he discloses the shocking hidden history possibilities of advanced technology and the covert schemes of the fascist power elite when he's not doing research he's also a true gearhead quenching the thirst for knowledge about racing cars first as a professional grand am and american le mans series racing driver uh, middle of the pack man behind the wheel of a corvette gt1 and a porsche gt3 r and later researching the history of the sport for his nascar dvd series and his little anton book series in fact he started writing during a two-year-long recovery from a racing accident his long recovery gave him time to do deep research on the topics his research continues to this day and is bringing forth some pretty astonishing and disturbing truths which he posts regularly on his website and Twitter, and we dig into right here. Sit back, relax. John Warner IV is a true American hero, and I can't wait for you to hear this one. I had to edit this thing a lot. It was four hours total, so we're just going to jump right into it, and we start talking about historical bioweapons. This is part one. And, of course, it gets out of hand. Bioweapons are stupid. The Germans learned that in World War I. You know, they call it the Spanish flu, but... No one's quite sure. Some say it was developed in America, maybe in Germany as well. We're not sure. No one's quite sure. But that went south in a big way. My grandfather was um, an army doctor on a troop train in World War I. And my grandmother was a U.S. Army nurse. And that's how they met. So I'm alive. My family's alive because of the Spanish flu. Wow. 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 That's amazing. I know there's so many parallels between the two, the Spanish flu and what's going on now. And it was, yeah. you know, I kind of looked at it and it's like, it just went away. Right. Is that kind of like, I mean, they had, a, they, they didn't really come up with like a cure. They didn't come up with like, they came up with ways, you know, they basically put people outside, let them have a bunch of oxygen, the sunlight. And well, I mean, you know, the way, the way my grandmother told the story was that, you know, and of course scientists will tell you whenever a virus or a pathogen hits mother nature, it mutates. Right. Mm-hmm. It can get really nasty, but usually it mutates into a lesser uh, form and it becomes mm-hmm. less you know, deadly. And so that's what happened. I think with Spanish flu is it hit Mother Nature. It ran its course and then slowly dissolved. But I think with bird flu and swine flu and other things, you know, people have tried to you know, weaponize these things and they never work right because they're indiscriminate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I, I was really... Yeah. So, Mustard, Mustard gas. Yeah, World War One, right? It was just wind like, changed and killed just as many Germans. You know, it was, it was foolish weapons. It really are. I, was, I remember it was so bad that they outlawed it. They're like, all right, all this other war is okay, but we're not going to do any more gas. <laughs> like after World War One, they're like, that's it, no more. Like we're not doing this. Well, on the Russian front, in World War Two. I mean, Joseph Farrell tells the story, but I, I, it makes sense to me as a military historian. I mean, the Russians were taking millions of casualties, so we think they had thermobaric rockets with coal dust and fuel oil in them that were like small tactical nukes but they might have lobbed some uh crude very crude atomic uh weapons even drove them with a truck and detonated by radio Mm -hmm. and there's a letter and it exists it's from stalin through the swedish embassy down to germany and it exists it's real um but it says if you use those weapons again we will unleash the entire Red Army biological and chemical weapons in one fell swoop. Now, Hitler used gas on his own people willy-nilly. Uh, 
but he was had hysterical blindness twice. I think he was burned by gas once um, in the trenches. Um, you know, he's a psychopath, but he's not a coward. He won the Iron Cross, but I think he listened to that. And, you know, he cared about the regular German Aryan people and children, and he loved children and dogs. You know, so he was a, he was a terrible psychopath, but I think in that one case he relented. <laughs> but they killed, you know, some say in Russia. I've been in contact with Russian military people, and they say, "Oh no, it's it's got to be thirty or thirty-two million is the real." Wow. Casualty. Now you have disease and starvation, absolutely, mm -hmm. but the Russians didn't kill their own troops as much as we're told. They did. They had penal battalions, and they they retreated. They were shot. Right. Um, but that's been overused and you can't kill that many people with conventional weapons. Well, well I think, I think there is a, I've read at some point, they just marched Russians without any weapons at all. They're like, you're just going to go. They did. And, and they did that, but it wasn't as prevalent as, you know, the movie enemy at the gates and everything as we're told. Right. Uh, that right. did happen though. Um, they, they were short of, of arms and ammunition. Uh, 43, they were cranking out a lot especially tanks, T-34s. But as far as biological weapons and these things, I, I think I think a few historians, J.P. Farrell also, you know, Hitler relented because he knew the horror of it. And he didn't want that on his own people. He didn't care about the Jews, the undesirables, or you know, the Russian prisoners. He didn't care about those people, but he cared about his own people. Hmm. Yeah. I've just been reading recently about... Um, Unit seven three one in Japan. You know about this one? Yeah, Biological. terrible in China. Yeah, yeah, a lot of disgusting stuff. You know. And believe me, we got all that data after the war, German and Japanese. Well, I saw that because that news came out a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, it's just out there now that the U.S. were literally working with them. They were taking a lot of that data, and um, some of those experiments apparently were taken back to the U.S. Oh yeah. Um, so it's wild, like, and that stuff's terrible. You know, like horror stories. <laughs> it is terrible. And, it, and you know, when I was talking to my grandfather in, I think it was 1985, Paul Mellon, it, I, I remember asking him, I said, my gosh, what did we get in Project Paperclip? Is it true we got all the Nazi experiments? He's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure we did. Mm -hmm. He was part of that, mm -hmm. Project Paperclip. Um, so they got everything. I mean, war is a dirty business. And the Cold War was even dirtier business. And it's involved with UFO technology, of course, highly. Uh, but there's, I mean, yeah, people like General LeMay and, and the real hawks and, and the real, you know, conservative fascist types, they want all the dirty weapons they can get their hands on. And the data and scientific and nonlinear physics they can get their hands on. Mm. You know, everyone's like, oh, no, no, we didn't have that Nuremberg trials. And that was a dog and pony show. Where was Hans Kammler, you know? General SS Hans Gommler, not in the Nuremberg. I mean, he, he was spotted in the U.S. You know, I've talked to three historians who have done that, a really good book on Hans Kammler, and they don't think he made it to the U.S. But I, I think that's a lie. A lot of the German guys did. And he had a lot of things to trade to the Americans. No, uh, yeah. People think, oh, he's a contractor. And, 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 oh, no. He came so up with a slave labor idea for the death camps. Wow. I mean, yeah, I had a, I had an argument with the guy who wrote the book. I said, I love your book. I read it, but come on. These guys made it to Argentina and they definitely visited the U.S. I don't know if he lived here, but he was, the story goes, he was seen at NASA a couple of times in the early 60s, late 50s. Mm. Wow. So, I mean, wow. it makes sense. Yeah, it does. And unfortunately, we don't have proof and facts and, you know, the documents. If somebody asked me on Twitter, it's like, do you have documents to, to prove that Lou Elizondo is worth the CIA? I'm like, he works with my cousin and Hal Putoff and Jim Semiman. <laughs> They're all CIA, DIA, and National Reconnaissance Office, and probably a little bit of ONI in there. And my ONI Navy captain friend said, oh, yeah, Lou, you know, he worked for us, too. <laughs> Mate, whatever crazy. you say about it, though, that they're going to... The people who don't want to agree with that are just going to say the opposite, aren't they? And that's that's the nature of the UFO Twitter sphere. <laughs> You're right. It's everywhere, though. I mean, it, 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 I, I understand people want to go to the official government representatives or, or you know, Lou is rogue, he's a whistleblower. Come on. 
you got to look at these people's track record and you got to look at the UFO disclosure movement before 2017 when Chris and Lou and everybody at TTSA came out, which, you know, I'm glad they did. Uh, they moved the narrative forward and now they moved it sideways. Mm -hmm. The only reason they came out is so they can create a new space where they can control the narrative and, and keep it moving sideways and slow it down. Yeah, yeah. So tell me, right, so in terms of their motivation for first starting it to get people interested and then secondly for slowing it down, what's the motivation? You mean to slow it down? Yeah, to slow it down now after, since 2017. Or move, and move it sideways. And they've been slowing yeah. it down for 60 years. Right. Project oh, yeah. Blue Book. Uh, Condon Report. came out yeah. with yeah. Swamp gas and, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. in the 80s. They, 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 but now with the internet, it's much harder to do that. And I've been told no one can, can completely control the internet. They can try and no one can shut it down because it's protected. Mm -hmm. ET and human alike, probably. Um, it's the embodiment of the collective human consciousness. Regressive, positive, negative, you, you, it's everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one person wrote me and said, why are you so negative? And I'm like, I'm not negative. I'm, I'm, I'd like to think positively, but I'm a realist. Mm -hmm. And I've been around spooks all my life. I've got a, a dozen friends who have worked for CIA, DIA, and when I, I mean, come on. Well, I think for me, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm of the same mindset because, you know, you know, I'm like, the reason I met you is because I researched your family and you, and that's how I met you. So um, it was you. It was me. It was all me. And then I sold I that information to the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> and he got that microphone. That's all he got. <laughs> and they gave me this microphone. <laughs> but that's how but, synchronicity uh, works. You know? Sorry? That's how synchronicity works. It is. So, yeah. but, but in the same vein, that's what I did with TTSA and the players involved in it. It was like, well, this is amazing information and I love it. All the stuff I'm being told, it's fantastic. But, you know, after a few months of just hearing the stories, I'm like, well, I'll, I'll actually research the people involved. Right. And that just takes you down a million rabbit holes. And I don't think there's ever an organization where you could just go, every single one of these people is connected to either a mystical organization, a secret society, a, a family of a committee of 300 family, blah, blah, blah. Like every single one of them, yeah. Like, well, apart from, apart from Lou, because Lou's a, a, a new character on, on the scene, just about every single one of the other ones. You he's new in public, but my O and I people, they tell me he's been around this, you know, counterintelligence stuff. You know, obviously it's public. He's a counterintelligence U.S. Army operative. Mm -hmm. And he's trained to lie. I mean, people just don't, I mean, they don't try to hide his career. No, he, he doesn't either. Here's a, here's a spook spook. He's trained to lie. You know, he could talk the bark off a redwood tree in California. You know, he, he speaks for hours. I mean, I, I my hat's off to the guy. He can speak for two hours and yeah. say so little. <laughs> it's incredible. I, you, really. The, the, the recent one, he did one. I, I caught a little bit of it. And he saying a little bit more. He was sort of talking. But he's getting a bit more into the, the philosophy of it all. Like, you know, think about have we been alone? Are these right. things on the planet now and that idea which is kind of like i remember when you sort of said um when chris mellon said to you mate you're into the, the wild stuff aren't you like tom delong <laughs> yeah but what this is and the wild stuff's always been there like yeah. in all the books with to the stars and when you start talking about the wild stuff it's wild stuff but when now lou's going down that route a little so we're starting to talk about the history of the earth where we come from what we are like dimensions like he's so talking He's no authority on that. You know, contact <laughs> Kerry Cassidy or Stephen Greer or Daniel List. They're the authority. They've been around doing this for 20 years. Even Dolan, mm -hmm. who I don't know, you know why he's trying to you know, put his head in the tiger's mouth. You can't negotiate with your head in the tiger's mouth. But he's mm -hmm. trying. You know, either benevolently he's trying to make a bridge. But I, I think you know, his, his work of the last four years is – gotten very soft and he only talks about old stuff and you know right. this is obvious you know that either he's been threatened and blackmailed and then they handed him a million dollars you know who's gonna you know <laughs> they threaten your family what yeah. are you gonna do but lou lou is no authority on anything any of this stuff they don't no, 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 no. i asked chris i said why don't you go 
to Greer, and he's like, oh, no, Greer's too wild for us. And I said, Greer is mostly the military stuff. Right. He's not even near the wild stuff. He doesn't talk about reptilians and, you know, Mars bases and, you know, the German Nachtwaffe. And, you know, he talks yeah. about stuff that he's, he's actually sat down. And he and I, that's why we're friends. He and I know some of the same people. Well, I mean, he was at my dad's office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, in I mean, 2001, you know. He's been but, painted a certain way, though, hasn't he? They've allowed that to happen. Like, it's, you know, because to be fair, man, like, I don't really have any issue with Stephen Greer. I know that there's been financial is issues, like, where people have called him out for making money out of certain things and then... Or dropping flares. I mean, Lewis said flares. that a couple of times, like, if you're going to drop a flare out of a plane. Yeah. He doesn't name Greer, but he said it a couple of times. Like, if you're going to go to a... Yeah. You're going to pay for an experience and then all of a sudden you're getting flares dropped out of a plane, like... Well, I'm old, but I'm old enough, and so are you guys, obviously, to know that Stephen Greer's been around for a long time. A long time, yeah. yeah. And when he was first coming out with the Disclosure Project and uh, the serious stuff, that was really good, man. Like, hats off. Well, that was serious stuff. And I remember that, that filtered out to the mainstream too. And it was a, it was a decent effort. And like, um, as time goes by, I mean, we're talking like nineties, right? We're like late, late nineties, yeah. like early two thousands. And that's where, you know, I learned, uh, I think we, from Ian Dolly too, he was telling me that, um, Tom DeLong hooked up with Greer and like, mm -hmm. And, and Greer would like carry a backpack full of VHS tapes of all these like testimonies around with him. And he was like hanging backstage at Blink-182 shows with Tom DeLonge. And so Tom DeLonge is like, oh, this is amazing. And I guess they had a falling out at some point. Um, you know, yeah, well, what, 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 was, what could that have been? Like a, a switch in? Oh, Tom DeLonge joined Chris Mellon and TTSA. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Greer had nothing to do with that. And that's when he called me in 2017. He's like, you, do you know your cousin? I said, yeah, a little bit, you know, but, you know, and then I reached out to Chris and we hadn't seen each other in 20 years, but we had several meetings and I really wanted to help him. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he insulted me. I don't think he wanted to insult me, but he said, oh, you and Tom DeLong think alike. And I, I said, I do not think like Tom DeLong. You know, I have nothing against Tom. I think his heart's in the right place. You know, but he holds back, and the book Secret Machines was, you know, ginger snap and lemonade. I mean, I'm sorry. But for the for like kids, well, and I see the kids, but, but like kids, like younger, like you know, in your 20s and your 30s or something. But if you get into that, and then it, like for for people that have no idea, not like us, but if people, if you just grab that book off the shelf and you're like, cool, that opens your mind up a little bit to possibilities yeah. that that yeah, most people won't even entertain, right? Yeah, it's not for. The, the disclosure movement per se that people not at all knowledge no. it's for everyone else and that's fine um but you know, the problem as somebody said it you know an activist does not get in bed with the cia and the dia and oni you know with T right. tsa and try to bring disclosure forward because those are the people that for the last 70 years have been doing every fucking thing they can to keep it secret Right. It's right. because of the dirty laundry. Now, the dirty laundry can be go wild from mile to wild, but it's definitely bank fraud. I mean, what was it? 2001, they said we're missing 2.3 trillion. And the next day it was 9 11. You know, Rumsfeld said that. Yeah. You yeah, yeah, can yeah. find a video of that. It was a big it's deal. Obvious. That's something they definitely want to keep. You know, <laughs> our drug shipments by the CIA, come on. I mean, that's why we're always going to be in Afghanistan. We never really left it. I guarantee you, they halo in special forces at night. And we have underground facilities there in the mountains. You know, we, the Taliban will control the heroin trade from now on, but we still get our cut. Yeah, and that's yeah, what yeah. a large portion of Vietnam was about the Golden Triangle heroin. My uncle, Stacy Lloyd, was in the American Information Service in Laos. That's mm -hmm. Air America. That's CIA. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. he drank himself to death. And, you know, the poor guy is the nicest guy in the world. But, you know, I always tried to ask him about Vietnam. He would not talk about it. Oh, Other than we were involved in the heroin trade. Well, it's just There's other stories about UFOs being seen and, you know, the MIAs. I mean, I had a special forces veteran at my farm. We host, we host a veteran deer hunt every year for wounded veterans. And he took me aside. He was in his 70s. And he's like, you know, I really, really appreciate what you do. And I said, no problem. You know, there's only two farms in Virginia that do it. But he said, let me tell you what happened to me in 1966. And I said, all right. And he says, I was in an Army Ranger Battalion, but we were a special unit of 350 guys. And we had special training. 
And I said, I think I know what you're talking about. And he's like, oh, yeah, because I he'd watched some of something, uh, an interview I did with Daniel List. And he said, um, this is not not more than a few months ago. And he said, we went to Cambodia across the border. We were night dropped in. And we had some firefights with the VC and, and uh, you know, and also uh, North Vietnamese regulars, uh, I forget which battalion. And he said something very strange happened. We had been, the UFOs have been seen all over Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And the word was, you keep quiet about it or, or else. What did they call them like enemy choppers? Or well, there was like a term oh, yeah. that they call yeah, them like as enemy, enemy choppers? Cho <laughs> <saw> an enemy <laughs> chopper. <laughs> an enemy chopper because the Viet Cong had choppers, right? And uh, they didn't, they didn't have any choppers. And I, we talked about that. And I, and I said, well, what happened? He's like, 12 of us came out. Wow. 350 guys went in. 12 came out. I said, what happened? Was there a firefight? And he's like, no. We went looking for the other guys against orders, and we could not find anything. No gear, no ammo, no guns, no bodies, no nothing. And Vietnam, no Vietnamese either. Either side. So, everybody was just disappeared? I, just gone. And the 12 or 15, I can't remember exactly the number that main, waited back to base, uh, they were given the riot act by the NSA. And he said, I, I know the NSA was there. But I'm sure it was CIA and every army G2 and every, all that those people. And they yelled at us and said, you are not to talk about this. But they did, but they, they gave no explanation though. Right. They were just like, just no. shut up. They're just like, uh, yeah, everybody's gone. And years later, I mean, for the last few years, I, you know, I've seen people come forward and talk about Vietnam. They talk about spider beings and they missing in action and that the Greys had an underground facility where they stole thousands of dead bodies. Wow. And they did their genetic experiments and all that. UFOs were seen everywhere by both sides. And now in 2021, a lot of uh, a good portion of American Vietnam veterans have moved to Vietnam. Mm. It's inexpensive. The beaches are great. The food's amazing. The people are really nice. And they've met up with, you know, North Vietnamese regular veterans. And they said, we have missing people too. Wow. Now that got my attention because his buddy had moved to Vietnam. And he's, he's like 75 too, you know, and that got, that really broke my heart. Because in DC, we have the, the Harleys get together every Memorial Day for the missing in action and everything. And I, I think personally, that's where they went. You know, they talk about the war in Syria a couple of years ago, and it's like there's 150,000 people that are missing. Really? Where did they go? Wow. You think never now, this is part of the dirty laundry that Lou and Chris Mellon and everybody wants to keep secret, is that they've oh. made dirty deals with E.T. Mm -hmm. Maybe they had a Hobson's choice, and they had no choice in the matter because they'll do it anyway. But they've made deals, and a part of the deal is, oh, if there's a war, take all the missing and wounded and dead you want. Wow. Now, that's, wow. that's what I think. Now, I'm not yeah. alone in that, but it, it, that's, a hard, that's a hard one to swallow because, you know, I've had friends' fathers who fought in Vietnam. And, well, you know, that, that makes me think that, you know, if you came in, in, into touch with a race of beings that were forceful enough to make you do that to allow that to happen i'd say that you know we're prey aren't we so in that response to that race so whoever they are, are extremely malevolent it's crazy stuff man like um it needs a book writing john yeah <laughs> sure I, I mean i'm not sure i mean I, if i wrote a book on vietnam maybe i would do that but um i mean i i feel like i've lived part of it when i was a kid i was in the pentagon and all the admirals and people would get in my dad's office when he was secretary of the Navy and they would scream and yell. Mm. My dad had a painting in his office. I'll never forget it of a wounded uh, American blindfolded being led by North Vietnamese regular troops to prison. And I remember a little kid and that made me, you know, cry and yeah. he, generals and admirals yelling and screaming about, you know, we got to end this war and blah, blah, blah. You know, at all costs, you were just losing men, in a meat grinder, it's stupid and for no, but they don't, you know, at that time they didn't know about the Pentagon papers and, you know, mm -hmm. how valuable all that heroin and other things in Vietnam really were to people in black programs and CIA. And, you know, and when I talk about the CIA, DIA and ONI, you know, I'm talking about the 10% of those people. Mm -hmm. Because when I talked with this with my 
childhood friend. He's like, I can't believe anyone in uniform would do some of these unconstitutional criminal things. And I said, Daniel, the people I'm talking about, the 10%, they change uniforms five, six times a day. They're O&I in the morning, they're CIA at night, and they're DIA in the next morning. Wow. It doesn't matter. And he had a hard time with that, but he did know what we did agree on a bunch of other stuff. Mm. Um, and, you know, compartmentalization is very ironclad too. It works like a charm. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, you, I mean, you're talking about an organization that deals in secrecy and ruthless stuff, and then like most of society, ten percent are sociopaths. So you get a sociopathic CIA agent, <laughs> yeah, or worse, pretty, or worse. worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, Alan Dulles was a psychopath. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah, absolutely. It seems that way. <laughs> I mean, so many of these I consider my are, grandfather, Paul Mellon, a sociopath. He was cold and distant. And I knew the guy. Well, I think that when you get into the idea of like world planning, like the, you know, <laughs> engineering how things are going to play out over decades or centuries, you've got to have an element of that in you. You've got to be slightly sociopathic because of megalomaniac tendencies, I suppose. Unless the unless someone someone's shown them that what they're up to is truly the right thing to do. I don't know, man. It's weird, isn't it? Or, or you have no choice. Like it's duality. You know, I mean, we all, I mean, I'm, I have my bloodthirsty side, you know, I, it, it's duality. We all struggle with it. Yeah. 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 You know? yeah. Me too. Absolutely. Like, and I don't know. It's whether you want to keep it in check or not. And I know that you get some, some sort of like belief systems where they, they go through periods of time where they'll ex exercise their darkest side to like, show that when they actually do get to the point where they've got to there, they can then go to the light and take that to the extreme too. Weird stuff, man. The right. Spanish Inquisition, you know, things like that, right? Abs absolutely. Yeah. Comes to mind, right? Or, you got to be, oh, well, you're, we're going we're gonna to do this, but come on, Jesus is going to be here for you. Yeah. yeah, in the name so of God, we're doing this. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the Crusades, any of that stuff, you know? Well, we, have a, we have an incredibly bloody history. And as the three of us know, who have studied the occult and, and alternative history and, you know, it's so much bloodier than we're, we're even led to imagine. And it's like, we've got to come to terms with it. You know, I, I agree with people when they said we need to, you know, meditate more and be more mindful and, and think positively and, and the world will change. The, the vibration will rise. And I, I agree with that a hundred percent, but not at the expense of turning away completely. You've got to, the yin and yang symbol is right in our faces a little yeah. bit of light in the dark, a little bit of dark in the light, but they're at odds, you know, constantly moving around and around. And it's like, we've got to come to terms with the dark side of human history. What's going on now? Mm -hmm. If we're ever going to make it to being a class one civilization, which is free energy and no poverty and, and, and all that stuff. So it has to be done. Are you in... Um in terms of moving things forward, would you be in uh, favor of like an amnesty almost, or do you think it should be like punishment? No, how, how are you going to punish a hundred million people or why? <laughs> I think you're talking, John Luke's talking about like the U S government agency kind of stuff, right? More, okay, more or less. A few million people. I mean, you know, lock up the department heads. Sure. The people in charge, but you know, they're making deals and amnesty deals right now in secret. I'm sure of it. You know, I don't have any proof of it, but, you know, I'm sure they are because a lot of this is like, ah, what are we going to do? You know, what are you going to do? And so sure. you've got to say to someone, come over to our side and we'll, you know, no punishment, you know, and tell us and help us. Because a lot of these people in these, you know, black, unacknowledged, you know, special access programs are blackmailed. Yeah. You know, the scientists, they were like, captured somewhere or kidnapped and they're like well, sit down this terminal and design us you know a zero point you know gadget and you know oh by the way you're here for life you're going to be in a deep underground military base for the rest of your life you know or else mm -hmm. and you do what are you going to do you've got kids and a wife you don't want them to be hurt i mean these right. people are hardball yeah just i've met some of these psychopaths you know they're cold people you just get a vibe around them I mean, I was in the Oval Office in 2007 when President Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld gave my dad an award and put his name on the submarine. I mean, my ex-wife and I were in there, and I'm telling you, I froze solid. Really? 
just in the presence of them. Yeah, and she did too. She she was not a conspiracy oh, UFO person. Got me excited at all. <laughs> like, you know, I really did feel that it was really horrifying. And those guys were if, if those guys aren't the three horsemen of the apocalypse, <laughs> hell's bells. I don't know who is. Wow. Yeah. Because I had known that you know after nine eleven, there's a picture of my dad walking with them in front of the Pentagon where the, you know, pl the plane hit. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, I'm a pilot. I said, there's no debris. There's no engines. There's no where the wings went in. And my father would not talk with me about it. He said, right. son, I am not talking about it. Wow. I said, it was a cruise missile, wasn't it? A tomahawk. Didn't say anything. He, Do you think he and I were, at, you know, we're very, we were very close friends, yeah. my dad and I. But after that, that he, was, he would not because he knew he was trying to protect me. Wow. Could, Same thing with the MJ-12 files. He didn't want me to go down. But, you know, in later life, the last few years, he, he knew. You know, that's why he urged me to come forward. He says, I, I trust your judgment. You need to do what you have to do. You're right. You know, he knows Chris Mellon very well. They work together on Capitol Hill. Yeah, yeah. You know, so my dad was a magic member. He's a majority for Joint Intelligence Committee, which well, doesn't officially exist. So it doesn't. Your dad was a member of, a, of something that doesn't exist, but you know it exists because you were there right it was chris mellon was a part of that well i think so, i think so yes um because he worked with chris when he was on the select intel committee hmm. uh, now there's a lot of groups and and you know my dad said you know they didn't call it that but you know i i had dealings with chris and and also links with other you know groups that were you know above top secret and and that's what magic is i think it's an older term for it they change the names of MJ-12 and Magic all the time for security purposes. Right. And he said, but, you know, he did talk to, you know, very secret groups where there was very limited people. Mm. Because, you know, not everyone in Congress is on board with the big plan. But my dad was, you know, he was a, very close to the Navy and Marines. Uh, you know, they had his back. Uh, he didn't have special interests breathing down his neck because he, he was very close to them. And they kind of protected him that way. Would he, um, would he have known that, that group to be called magic or would he have known it as something else? Do you think magic's a term that's been put out there or do you think it's a real group? Um, I think probably it was a real group back in the day, maybe in the 80s. But as far as my dad was concerned, he knew about MJ-12 for sure. He's like, oh, oh yeah. yeah. And of course, yeah. my wife, when she worked for the CIA, found the MJ-12, you know, on the internal server and in CIA, and of course you can't yeah. access it without cosmic clearance and all their you know passwords and things like that. But it, it existed, and it triggered a silent alarm. And her boss, you know, at the time was like, "Don't worry, you know, everyone tries to access the files." And I know. <laughs> Don't do it again. And I know. Just you know, roll with it, and, and it was no big deal because you can't get in there. It's only the minority, five percent of these intel agencies who have access to you know, UFO grade stuff and, you know, ETs working in the basement. You know, so I had heard, you know, they, they do at the Pentagon and lower levels. They do at the CIA, they do at the NSA and on and on and on, mm -hmm. but at the lowest levels, because the lower you go, the higher the clearance. So you know, like it. any any of that, you know, valiant Thor thing. I remember when I was real young, my dad, that was like a big deal because my dad's, you know, he's 80 something now. Right. But he was like, valiant Thor was a big deal. This guy said he was from Venus. He showed up and it, it was, you know, stranger at the Pentagon uh, with a book by Frank Stranges, you know, that's been made into a couple of little tiny movies, but you know, valiant Thor, somehow this guy talked himself into the Pentagon and, you know, there's photos of him and, and things like that. Do you have any, uh, information about that or you know, what's your gut feeling about it or anything? Cause that, that to me was like, how did this guy just show up? He says all this stuff and then ghosts, you know, I don't have any personal information, but um, look at the amount of science fiction films that were made in the fifties mm -hmm. when Val Thor was supposedly, uh, you know, advising Ike and right. you know, the Pentagon at, at that point. And it was, you know, the attack of the giant spart spiders of Venus and, you know, 50 foot tall naked woman. And yeah. You know, so they put out a huge blanket of information and disinformation. I, I think the 1950 classics right around that year was the thing. And right. also the one that was filmed in DC, which was uh, the day the earth stood the still, right? Yeah. I, you, they were very, you know, one was the angry monster, which is sort of disinformation, I think. 
And the other one was very, very close to disclosure. Because I think there were a lot of people in government and military in the know who thought, oh, by 1960, no problem. You know, Ike would, you know, and it didn't happen. And it certainly didn't happen when Kennedy tried to release the UFO file. So I think there's a lot of uh, circumstantial evidence that points that, you know, we had visitors from all over the place in the 50s. Some were really trying to help us. And I think mm-hmm. they have. But, you know, the bad guys, the regressives, you know, they, they've been up to a lot of mischief. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, it's soaked in blood. So... so- do you know people like, about, like the idea of the valiant Thor, like the human, the very human alien uh-huh. um, that can pass for human? Uh, I mean, that concept kind of is the one that's been the most comfortable since the fifties with like the, the George Damsky stuff, as in, and I suppose as time's gone by, like the idea that the Nazis might have been working with some sort of Nordic race and so on and so forth. Right? Do you reckon that's? Do you reckon there's any truth in any of that? I, I do, yes. Yeah. I think there's, there's, you know, if it's easy to make fun of the whole, you know, Nazi, you know, they, they do it in the films, uh, Iron Sky, you know, ha ha ha, you know, and flying saucers, Antarctica, it's all, it's easy to dismiss it on the face of it, it sounds ridiculous. You know, Venusians in, in the White House, it all sounds, you know, kooky and, and corny. Right. Um, but if you do, you, you know, the big history of German history, they've been, the German people have been genocided since Roman times. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Romans really tried to kill all the Goths and the Visigoths and, you know, the Iceni or whatever. And yeah. they, didn't, they didn't work. And they ended up sacking Rome and everything like that. But I mean, the Germans, the Germanic peoples, you know, have had a long history of, of trying to be wiped out by the church. And, you know, then the Martin Luther came along. Oh boy, that went over like a Led Zeppelin, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, and certainly since the 19th century, they were like, enough is enough. We need to unite Germany. And the NIMSA story with the Sonora air club and the 1897 airship mystery, right. that lends some credence. And also the, the civil war with Lincoln and, and secretary of war Stimson with the, uh, the airship that was shown, uh, what was it called? The Aurora or something. So, uh, so we think in the, 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 the I think they were... did probably the Germans and Prussians at that time, they figured out through alchemy and other sources, the, you know, Vedic texts, mm-hmm. they were like, aha. And they found very crude. They figured out very crude anti-gravity using a spinning drum and, and liquid mercury, red mercury isotopes, how they did the isotopes. I don't know, but, it, it, the Sonora Air Club was out in uh, Sonora, California, right. during the you know, right after the gold rush. So you mm-hmm. need a lot of gold to make monatomic gold, which is a room temperature superconductor. Right, and that's what they use in the black triangles in the nodes, the three three round nodes. It's ballistic glass coated with um, uh, an Indian physicist I, told me how this works. Um, you coat the ballistic glass with a uh, powdered quartz, and it's based with a, 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 a it's made with a silver based based plasma. So it's treated, and then you have a monatomic gold between a lead insulator and a positive node, and this creates a mini torsion field, which you, is used for your maneuvering and power. And uh, you know, plasma ring in the center, the TR three B G model. You know, it, that's how. You know, it's not that hard once you figure out the basics of it. It was like, oh, Andy Gravity is impossible. It's like, crap, you know, there's a million videos, people throwing discs around, you know, electromagnetism floating in the air. You know, it's it's not that hard. Well, the idea of cold is hard. The Vimanas and, you know, and the, the, the ancient sort of Hindu stuff where they talk about it, even down to the technology. But what I think is interesting is when you start talking about stuff like monatomic gold, you know, because the one atomic gold stuff is, <clears throat> excuse me, mu- is it mufkas? That's how they pronounced it in the ancient Egyptian times. Oh, yeah. Yeah, manna from the... Yeah, manna from heaven. And the right. idea that there's, a, there's stories that this stuff was found um, in an excavation. Mm-hmm. Piles and, of it. Yeah, they, yeah, there's pictures of it. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, it's in the Sinai, like, isn't it? It's in the Sinai near Mount, where the Mount with the burning bushes. Right. Yeah. 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 There was actually dis- it was not a distillery, but it was like they made it there. That it was like a foundry where they they made them. There was piles of them. They couldn't figure it out. And it goes back to the biblical story too of Moses taking the golden calf and burning it and making them eat it. You know, and, and it was Moses like, might have been. Akhenaten. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, was, was the son of Akhenaten, being, right? All being, you know, partially human. Well, this is the other another race of humanity, you know, another human race. Uh, absolutely. Well, the, like the Mufkut stuff, the, the monatomic gold was heavily, well, they found heavy, heavily heavy references to it in the Temple of Dendera as well. So the Hathor stuff again, going back into all that. So it's strange how, like in the, the modern ufology narrative that we've got at the moment, you've got these ideas about certain things, monatomic gold in, being used in the black triangles, but then we'll take it over into the alchemy side and we can read about people, you know, in fact, Hal Putter, there's plenty, he's written plenty about this. And then you take those links back to what we talk about. If you ate that stuff where you consumed it in ancient Egypt, it would reduce the density of your body and take you closer to being a light being mm-hmm. as a concept. Crazy shit, man. <laughs> well, maybe it's not crazy. Maybe it's absolutely true. Yeah. That's what, that's what the philosopher's stone is. Mm. You know, uh, one's consciousness in the alchemical process, but a lot of it was was not about turning lead into gold, but gold into monatomic gold. Right. And I know it exists. I mean, I've talked to physicists about it. They make it. I mean, the U.S. Navy makes it. I know that for a fact. Wow. Um, so it's, you mean, can make it in your house. It, you can make it at your house. It's it's not that hard of a. Uh, I don't. I'm, I'm not a physicist. I don't. You know, I'm not an alchemist. Maybe you are. <laughs> no, John is. John, John will do it. No, we'll uh, I mean, we John will do it in his kitchen. You know? Yeah, I got a couple pots and pans back here. We'll just fire some up. Yeah. Crack the earth in half when you do it, please. <laughs> And then, no, but, but it goes. Here. I live here. Yeah, it goes back to like the whole thing is like it, we go back to the whole thing where like the esoteric and the you know the mystery schools and all that shit is the foundation for all a lot of this. And I would say I would probably say most of it. Most of it started at the mystery schools and all this stuff. And then throughout time, it's been bastardized or it's been utilized in different terms or, or forces. And in my mind, I've been toying around with this idea. And you know, Dalon came out. With, and, um, it was last week or two weeks ago, and he said in an interview I and mean, he's been talking a lot more lately but he said you know you know we found out that you know maybe you could do this this dark ritual and you can sacrifice you know these somebody or something and this stuff works but or you can go and pray and it does the same thing he's like but the same thing he's like but if you do the the sacrifice thing it works faster but you know it's the same thing if you pray and i'm thinking my mom it's like i always i think about like her and i think about how they cling on these things and it runs their entire life. And then, then my mom looks at me with all this UFO stuff. She's like, she's trying to wrap her head around it. But I think that the things that really matter to her is that there is immortality for the soul and there is love out there. And, and I would tell her, I go, you know, she, cause if you ask her, go like, why are you Christian? She'll say, Oh, I know it in my heart. When I found God, this happened. They heal the blind. Mm-hmm. I've seen the videos or know people that were there when they're praying over somebody for three days, boom, they're like, they get their vision back. And it's like, I've seen miracles. And I would say, awesome. But guess what? Do you know that they're healing the blind in Islam too? Do you know that they get down and they pray to Allah or whatever, and they fucking do it? So why is it working over there too? If your God's the only God, because it's not about God, it's physics. It's literally energy healing. Mm -hmm. It's literally consciousness. So just replace, you know, the word God with consciousness. And it doesn't matter what you call it. Now you can like sacrifice a baby and be the Nazis and do ritualistic satanic shit. It will fucking work. Mm -hmm. And it might work easier and quicker. But if you sit around in a circle and meditate and make it loving and, and, and you're trying to change the world by projecting love, it will work and might take a little longer, but it will be, I think they found a factor in some of these clinical studies, like seven to 10 times stronger. Mm-hmm. Like it's because it's coming from source. So you can do both. One's like the easy way to make money. One's the harder way, but more fulfilling, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I think we're going to find all these things out and, um, and we're going to look at the universe differently. We're going to look at ourselves differently. And then we're going to, we're going to, um, be in a much better place here shortly is my goal. 
you know, when you go back to the Crowley and the Parsons and all that stuff, and, and you know, the, the intelligence agency had their hands in that really deep. I mean, you know, Crowley was working for the intelligence agency in Britain and, and you know, in England and everything else for the time. And you kind of you kind of go, do they have some of this kind of the secret meeting where they get everybody together and they do some ritual and they do something and it's like, poof, we opened a portal and, and, every, and the, the government's like, here's a bunch of money. And then, you know what I mean? Like, did this dark thing just start rolling and then we bring in the paperclip guys and now they're like going, yeah, we do this too. And then, you know, and like. I think it's always been there, man. Like, it's just always been there in the background. There's always been a certain group of people who are into that stuff. And, and it's like through the secret societies, you know, like they take you to that. You enter into it and uh, John, you can tell us, Warner, you can tell us more about this. <laughs> <laughs> I've only been on the taking it in part. I don't and you Do can I tell us yes. I mean, you have to, I think you, know? yeah, you have to, <laughs> you, have to you wrote this great, you wrote this, you wrote this great book. It has a lot of that in well, there I, a little bit in there, but uh, just read that. And, yeah. Read, yeah. Read that. And uh, when you, you read, read that, that. I don't knock your socks off. Because Why I is all of mine there? Um, go to wounded Crowley's in there. Crowley's in there, and mm -hmm. he meets with Churchill, which is true. Mostly, there are MI six files that that Most. do say, you know, Churchill met with Crowley. That's we know that because Crowley was MI six. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the occult has always been part of warfare, going back to you know whatever Babylonian or even Go Gobekli Tepe times. Mm. You know, it, it's always been part of that. The sons of Belial versus the children of the law of one in Atlantis is the legend. I right. mean, this is all nothing new. It's an energy about energy production and energy exchange. So the universe has been dealing with all this stuff on a metaphysical level since, I don't know, Forever. the beginning of, of the universe or the beginning of the cosmos. But it's, it's very strange until you really... And, and by the way, I want to mention... I, you know, my wife and I were talking today. I really admire you for joining the Freemasons to educate yourself. You know, 20 years ago, I kind of thought about it and I was like, maybe I should join, but I'm not a joiner. <laughs> <laughs> no, neither, neither am I. That's the thing. And like when I joined, I was like, I'm going in and I'm busting this wide open because I was reading Jim Mars every day. And like Jim Mars was talking about the Freemasons are ruining everything. And I'm, I'm like, I'm in, I'm going to, I'm going to hook up. I'm going to figure this all out. I'm going to call Jim Mars. I'm like, you're right. And then when I got in, it was completely different than I'd ever expected. Yeah, completely. It, again, it's the 5%. Yeah, at the top. Right. I mean, I mean, you know, and and but by being part of them, I think that was a, an amazing thing you did. And Thank I you. Credit for that because I didn't do it, and I was like, nah, I, I don't want to go to rituals. I don't want to go to meetings with a fez on or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean but, sure, the free beer is great. But, <laughs> you know, that's only in the shrine. Well, I've seen shrine. you wearing a fez. Oh, I, I don't have uh, you know what I do have. Oh, look at this. <laughs> calling him out, John Luke, calling him out. Look at that. Look at that. He's, he's, he's like, wait a minute. I saw you wearing a Fez. Shriner. Secret Shriner. This is oh, a genuine oh, look at that. World War II Africa Corps helmet. Whoa. <laughs> so there I am. Jeez. Uh, my have wife you seen got me that I was writing the book. She's like, you need the real thing. She found one. Wow. That's amazing. Um, that pulls Vril right into your skull, right? When you put that on, it just. <laughs> it the Anon Air Bay had them, with but they had an SS symbol. I won't. I won't own anything with an SS symbol. No, that's uh, not right. only bad occult, but that's regressive. And, but I, I think the occult has always been with us for certain things. Sadly, um, it's not necessarily all dark. It's it's half positive, half half dark, like everything else. But uh, in warfare, I think you know. I believe it's. It's true. It's a mass death ritual. Hmm. It's energy exchange. Uh, it's the light versus the dark. We fight these proxy wars. And I hmm. mentioned that in the book. I'd explain it well as best I can. Yeah. yeah. But Churchill knew this. And so did FDR. And so did G General George Marshall. And the scene in the first chapter, I believe that's exactly what took place. And that meeting really did exist. It hmm. really happened. And we know that Churchill was very shaken about Tobruk and all the losses of Australians and New Zealanders. But and Churchill was knew, a Mason. You know that, right? Certain certain dirty deals needed to be done behind the scenes.
Well, Churchill was a Freemason. You know, it was one of his big deals. I mean, and in England, you know, John Luke and I have been talking, and in America, it's different than England. You know, in England, John Luke says they nobody talks about it. It's kind of like you keep it hush hush. Nobody really says anything. And me, I'm like, I got a ring. You know, I got a, like a license plate. You know, I got stickers on my car. I don't care. You know, plate I mean, on your hot rod. You know, yeah, yeah, I do. I got them on my hot rods. I got square compasses on my hot rods. I don't care. You know, maybe it's changing a little bit, but I mean, you know, I went down and met the local Freemasons. With- during the first part of coronavirus, actually, and I had a chat with them and a couple of them, and they were really nice, man. Well, we didn't get too deep into stuff, but they were open and all that, but they would never, ever be on a podcast talking about their stuff. Um, it just wouldn't ever happen. But that's probably because they were 75 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't work the Zoom. <laughs> it was a crucian, so it was just like... But, um, and to be fair, I don't know anybody, any real young ones over here. But I saw a documentary recently where they sort of like went into the Freemasons in the UK. And the people that were representing it were just talking about like, oh, I'll set my own lodge up. And it's a, it's the football lodge where everyone that's in it loves football. It's like, <laughs> oh my God. My God. <laughs> so like, but I suppose that's the, the other side of it. Like there's the fraternity bit, isn't there? There's the guys who get into it because they, they want to go to hotels and drink and have like a nice buffet and raise some money you know and then there's the people like for me i'd be like just i want to get straight to the mysticism <laughs> where's where's the bookcase can i get into the bookcase and that, and that was that was me too i was like i was 26 27 and i everybody you know the the guy youngest to me was 74 or something like that and i was like where's the book where's it at and i go to him and i open it up and i'm like <laughs> it's like nobody's touched this in 70 years right i'm like holy shit like there was a really good data in there you know and i luckily found out that i found other guys that were closer to my age that were into the esoteric as well you know and i i kind of fell in with my ilk but i mean you could it could be anything but the amount of research and then the other stuff that i've done and, and learned and the people that i've learned like i'm sitting next to the prosecutor and the janitor and we're all on the same level everybody's cool and it's the coolest thing ever when we're hanging out we're just hanging out and there's you know and that's what i found out about but like you said warner the top percent that i'm probably will never get to right the 0.2 percent or whatever maybe there's something going on up there hell i heard that that putin was the head of all freemasons in russia and that Nobody else can be a Freemason and that's it. And he runs all of the shit in Russia. And if you say anything else, that's it. So it's like, I don't know. You really want to be in the, in the top 1%. Shit. No, I don't, I don't know if I want to be where I'm at right now. (laughs) I think most Masons are very positive people. Yeah. Oh yeah, Um, for sure. But it is a patriarchal organization. It is. When I went to the temple here in Alexandria, the George Washington. Amazing. Isn't it beautiful? Women were kind of, you know, the, little sisters they were not equal status whatsoever right but they didn't understand the symbology as, as you know i'm not even that great in symbology but i knew a hell of a lot more than they did mm-hmm. and so i was like okay i wanted to confirm and I, they were very nice and i had a really good long talk with a lot of them and mm-hmm. they really did want to know the alternative stuff but um you know i think i think these anything that's secret you know, whether it be college organizations, Skull and Bones, at UVA, it's the Seven Society, mm-hmm. you know, that are secret. It's like, why so secret? Right. And the reason, I think, is because this is where they grew young people at, at colleges, you know, and, it, you know, and they learn, and as a Freemason, you learn to keep secrets. Right. And if you're conservative and fascist-minded, they're like, oh, maybe he's good for the 5% club. And then down the line, oh, you're one of us, huh? 3% club. And then if you really weren't aware of a Nazi armband, you're in the 1%. <laughs> oh, yeah. man. <laughs> we talk and about- it's like, we need to keep everything secret. We need to keep people under control as debt slaves around the world. This is how the system works. And, you know, these committee of 300 families like I'm in, I mean, mm. they're 95% of them are completely ignorant. No idea. So, no, about him. I, I'd, I'd bet the, my farm on it. I'm serious. But that 5% that's involved in banking and aerospace and military and blah, 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 and every Chris Mellon, they're read in to partial, but it's compartmentalized. Right. I've got a question for you. you know, Mr. Rockefeller might be at the top. <laughs> but, uh, All right. Let's, let's think. Let's go. I've been listening to a bit of, uh, lo- well, I love John Ronson. You know, the writer John Ronson. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, back in the 90s, was the channel. I think at the time he was working for Channel 4 in the UK. And he was the guy who did the documentary about the young Alex Jones 
oh, breaking wow. into the Bohemian Grove, yeah? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So when Alex Jones broke in, that was part of a BBC, oh, sorry, a British Channel 4 documentary that John Ronson had gone and was meeting freaky guys like Alex Jones, right? <laughs> but it was well, the story's so funny. I was reading it. And I'll, I'll get to my question in a minute, but um, Alex Jones said, right, I'm going to break in with my crew. So they, they apparently hiked up a mountain, did all, all that. This was their plan. John Ronson just put on like a pair of chinos and a polo shirt and walked, <laughs> up the gate and walked in. And, then, <laughs> and, then, and he goes, all it took was, he goes, I knew how to walk preppy and I knew how to wave like I was um, in charge of the world. <laughs> me, meanwhile, Alex Jones apparently was hiking across mountains. <laughs> It's really funny. Like him. But when they got in there, they said that obviously you've probably seen the video. There's the yeah. cremation of care ritual. Yeah, Moloch, so, right? Moloch, yeah. So they sack, you know, burn an effigy, blah, blah, blah. So you had the two takes of it. And then, so in this book with John Ronson, that after, the, after they've both gone in, they reconvene in a hotel room to talk about what they've just seen. John Ronson's kind of like, well, I had a nice time. It was really interesting, wasn't it? Like, so it was like, these people are the most evil people in the world. Yeah. But, like, one thing apparently that they all did was when the r- ritual was over, all these old fellas, and, you know, I guess the, the one percenters, all went and urinated publicly on the pathway. And he goes, and there was public toilets everywhere. Yeah. He goes, but they all just urinated on the path. So there was a river of urine. And then um, it's things like that. And you look at it and just be like, the people I know who've attended Bohemian Grove will have gone to this thing. We're talking like in Great Britain, John Major, Peter Mandelson, and then in your country, like everybody, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Not like, me. Have you been? Damn sure. You've been, um, yeah? No. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh! <laughs> my dad was never asked to go. I don't know if any Melons attended, probably some, Yeah. my guess. But, you know, let's... The Bohemian Grove, I know people that go. Yeah. They, they have a hilarious drunken time. And I think that's correct. However, personally, I think it's like concentric circles of compartmentalization. Oh, inside of it. Same thing. They're looking for the one percenters. And mm. so they go around and they mm. get to know people. And then you're invited back and invited back the next year and the next year until they whittle out, you know, the people who just want to go and network and get drunk. But mm-hmm. they, they find the serious people, the important people. And the then there, I think there's some blackmail going on and it may involve some, you know, children and pedophilia because that's the yeah. ultimate blackmail tool. Yeah, uh, yeah. Now the creation of care, I mean, my God, it's right there in your face. They don't Moloch. they want you to not care. Mm. So you know, a- Moloch, they, you know, my friend said, Oh no, you don't understand who Moloch is. And I said, No, I understand exactly <laughs> who Moloch is. And, the owl is representative of Hecate, who's an mm-hmm. Anunnaki goddess, and Inanna, and all these other things. And it's not about wisdom. It may be partially about wisdom, but come on. Hecate is, you know, this is the darkness. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. I'm not saying everyone that goes to the Bohemian Grove is, is dark-minded. I don't think they are. But no. they're looking for that 3%, 1%. They're, they're looking for the hardcore people, and they weed them out. And that's how you do it. And have a great time, a buffet, and... You, you know, know, run around yeah. naked, and I've, I've, I've heard there's tons of prostitutes. It's all male. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, I'll tell you, it's, it's funny this, this reading the um, John Ronson book or listening to his audio book. The, the book's called Them, by the way, yeah? So if anyone wants to listen to it, it's really yeah. worth it. And he, and he narrates his own audio book, so it's, they're hilarious. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, when he's walking around, he's kind of like, he likes it. Yeah? Like, um, Alex-, <laughs> <laughs> Alex Jones has got like, like face paint on and he's hiding from the trees and he's just Alex walking Jones through. In there and apparently ends up where, putting on his polo shirt and his chinos and getting around. And that's how he got to film the cremation of care and stuff. But um, John Monson's kind of like, when he's talking about it, when they're talking about it together, yeah, the room. Alex Jones is like, do you see all the motherfucking owls, man? They're fucking everywhere. The Satan is bastards. And like, um, John Ronson goes, but isn't it just like their emblem? Like if you went to a, like, you know, a, a Best Western hotel, like it's like their logo, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> like, you have these two conflicting sides. You have like this um, British guy who has kind of got no idea about it. And Alex Jones, who's the full-blown conspiracy theorist, then uh, it's, it's hilarious. But you've got to watch it. <laughs> where, where I was going with it, though, is that like you have, 
like people like John Major, who was the Prime Minister of Great Britain in the 90s, conservative, the most boring man on the planet, yeah? Like, <laughs> he, he's literally grey, he's that boring. Um, <laughs> he, he attended Bohemian Grove. So you look at things like, you know, like, what would he have done at Bohemian Grove? Like, when they went to a Moloch worshipping statue, like, I don't know, it just takes you down that rabbit hole and go, like, is John, was John Major okay with a Moloch ritual? Do you know what I mean? Weird shit, man. It depends what circle they're in. Mm. As you get to the close to the inner circle, I think they weed out all the tourists mm. you know, who are there for a good time and to network and just, you know, but presidents have gone and senators and all kinds of people attend those things. But they, t I think what I think personally, I, they're weeding out the chaff, mm. the kernels of wheat, and they're rare mm. because they need, they need new fresh blood, you know, as they say. And um, I mean, you know, we won't know until, you know, we crack it open uh, what the truth is on it. But I mean, come on, they're doing Babylon workings rituals. I mean, I'm sorry. The, the I mean, Crowley stuff. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, I know that it's duality and, you know, you shouldn't think in terms of good and evil, but fucking A. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I draw the line myself. I'm sick. This planet is so bloodthirsty and, and dark and, and negative. We've got to bring balance back. There's no I think way we're, off balance. Yeah, and I think that I go with the divine a place no. where they're going and going, let's save the environment. You know, <laughs> save the whales. No, they're not talking about that. <laughs> not at all. And they're talking it's about how do we let that African nation starve and how do we make money off that? Mm. That's what they're like, doing. So it's like obvious. Yeah, I've met yeah. these people, they're the Koch brothers. Oh my God, what arrogant bastards they are. Mm. I mean, seriously, no yeah. billionaire is, is uh, altruistic. None of them. Even if they give tons of money to something, all that money is being, most of it is being funneled back into the deep state. That's a joke. That's been since, you know, the 19th century, even earlier. Oh, I'm charitable. <laughs> Nobody gave to charities really in the, in the glittering age of the 19th century, the golden age. The Gilded Age is what I'm looking, thinking of. You know, that, that's, it's a 20th century thing. Well, that, that goes into like Elon Musk and stuff, right? I mean, like I look at Elon Musk and I swear that Elon Musk is this century's Howard Hughes. Now, in only terms of the way that I think of it is Howard Hughes had the Glomer, I think, that where the CIA and came to him, and you know, because the Russian sub had sank off in the Pacific somewhere. You guys are familiar with this story? Like that yeah. there's a Russian sub that sank in the 67. What else were they getting off the bottom of the ocean? I don't know. They, the, the whole, the whole, that's, the front was that Howard Hughes was going to mine the ocean floor for gold and platinum and all this shit. But really, yeah. he had no say in any of this, and it was the U.S. government that went and had a giant ship built that they've never built before. The most, uh, you know, accredited people ever built a ship that they they basically came out of thin air and they grabbed a sub from the bottom of the ocean and pulled it up and it broke in half, but they wanted to get this Russian sub and they got it up and the Russia and Jap Japan and all these people are coming around him and they're just like, Hey, we're just doing research. Howard Hughes is our boss. And then they brought that shit back and it was like, we have all this stuff. And that didn't come out until Obama was president. They were like, yeah, we did that. Here's your, here's your bodies back, Russia. Oops. But I think Elon Musk is doing that shit now. Cause they're like, Hey, we're going to have Starlink. Hey, we're going to go to Mars. Hey, we're going to like, we've already done all that shit. We just need somebody to go out there and be the rich weirdo who says we, that I'm going to do it. And that's Elon Musk. Yeah, so you think I think you're absolutely right. Mm. You know, he, he, you know, Tesla cars, uh, it's not an automobile company. It's a tech company. Right. So I get in a lot of arguments about these cars. I, I like electric cars in the future, but we're going to need zero point energy. I'm sorry. They'll figure out a way to charge us. Trust me. I think we <laughs> already have it in the back room. Testing it. Yeah. yeah. The military's had it for 70 years or 65. And so Elon Musk is a long line of sort of Howard Hughes types. It's sort of a cover story of, you know, he's, everyone loves him. All the electric scooter crowd, they love him. Oh, my, the cars and everything. And it's like, he gives me a really bad feeling. I, tell you, because I, used to, I used to walk around saying to people, oh, man, and a lot of people I did as well. Um, yeah, he's, he's like a modern hero, man. Like the stuff he's doing is fantastic. And then there was this thing that happened a few years ago, you know, um, when there was some kids trapped in a cave in Thailand. Oh, Thailand. Yeah. And he called the guy a pedophile or something. That yeah. Was over there, right? It was like the British, British rescue diver who'd gone in to help him. And, and so they didn't need to use his crazy cool sub. 
they just used this guy's diving techniques or whatever. And he was just like, the guy's a pedophile, yeah, he's a, or a pedo diver or whatever. And just seemed to want to just trash the guy, man. It's like, what's this about? Unless, of course, he knew something. But it was just really weird behavior for like the richest man in the world to call <laughs> out this dude whilst a load of kids are trapped in a cave. Yeah? Weird. I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah, that's, that's what that's really? what it was. There was a, there was a bunch of kids trapped in a cave underground underwater, and like he yeah. he had like some specialty stuff that he sent over there. I can't remember what it was, but yeah, you're right. There was like a local diver guy. Was the guy from England, John Luke? I don't yeah. know. He was a he was a British diver, and he was in Thailand at the time, and he's a rescue diver. And I don't know if he lived out there or something, but the kids had gone in like they were Thai kids, and they'd gone in quite deep in with their teacher. The tide had come in, filled up the entire channel. And it was like, it was literally like, it's a matter of time, you know, till we, till they die. And so they had to send in something to get them out. So Elon Musk was like, well, I've got this sub. I don't know. I think it was, I don't want to make it up, but it was, I've got some, this, this device that can get us through, get the kids out. And meanwhile, this British diver had just kind of gone and done it. Uh, or he <laughs> offered a solution. And so Elon Musk was like, just called him a pedo. <laughs> This pedo guy or whatever, yeah? Called him pedo guy all over Twitter to his multiple million followers. Right. I remember seeing it and just being like, this is outrageous, man. Like, and, and literally up until that second, I'd never, heard it, I'd never had any bad thoughts about Elon Musk. But as soon as I see something like that, you just go, yeah, yeah, what's going down here? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> People will always give their power away to celebrities. Um, I've seen it firsthand. You know, my, my father's wife was Liz Taylor and I've known Paul Newman. He was a great guy, but they all live in a bubble. And the reality is they have to change the reality to deal with the fame. Hmm. I've seen mm -hmm. it firsthand. Yeah. Like, tons of celebrities. I, I don't care to know them. Paul Newman was great. We raced together, you know, but that's awesome. Gearhead. But, you know, that was different, but he still lived in a bubble in, and, and I called him out on it. And it's, it's a protection mechanism and so they say stupid shit and they say weird things and Madonna's doing all this satanic imagery. I mean, it's just madness. Mm. And, uh, but what, what, boy, what was it like having dinner famous? with Liz Taylor though? What was, I mean, I got to know that it was like Liz Taylor sitting next to you at a dinner Warner when you were like, <laughs> like well, a teen. Was, yeah. She was great. She was, was she? funny and down to earth. She liked going to NASCAR races and drinking beer and eating fried chicken with the boys. And that's awesome. She believed in UFOs and ET and, so much so that I remember my dad and the three of us got in an argument with my best friend there. We were stoned. We were like 14 or 15. <laughs> and my dad's like, there's no. And I thought, why is it? You know, she's like, why are you so angry? Yeah. And it's because I think he knew and it really, uh, really freaked him out. Wow. He knew the truth of the world, at least his small slice of it. Mm -hmm. At that time, this is like 1978 or something. If I'm 1979. And she's like, why are you so angry? We're just talking about you know, Star Trek and, and you know, out, life out in the universe. And like, yeah. I don't care. God would never do that to us. Wow. Like, That's not a religious guy. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, he pulled the God minute. card out on everybody and he's not religious. He that card. What, how many more H's do you have up your sleeve? <laughs> uh, What's Mark next? Luther would never go, you know. <laughs> I mean, so I, I know now that he was, he was really freaked out by talking about it. Oh, man. It was only until I, I, the Majestic 12 files, and I, I pushed him on that, and he finally broke. He said, they've got it all under control out in you know, Arizona or Nevada. Don't worry about it. You'll never find anything, and it's not that big of a deal. But, of course, it was, it was a, it's a massive deal. Wow. And I think wow. he only knew his section of it. You know, sure, we found a few crashed UFOs, and we got some alien bodies, and we're back engineering everything we have from two crashes, Corona and, and, you know, Roswell. Well, that's a bunch of bullshit. You know, we thousands and tens of thousands of crashes. And that's what that sh Howard Hughes ship, the Glomar Explorer, that was picking up UFO parts. Oh, wow. As well, I've heard that. Yeah, there were minerals that they were going to scavenge. That's not cost effective. If you no, no, no. You yeah. need another type of ship and a dredge to do that. That was all a cover story. Yes, a Soviet sub is in, an interesting thing to go after, but I think that the mostly the Navy and everyone else was using that to pick up crashed UFOs because, you know, as we all know, you know, you could be fifth dimensional and you come flying into the Earth's atmosphere, you're in the third dimension all of a sudden, and you forget to flip the proper switches or do whatever you need to do psychically. Boom. Wow.
or somebody's using a scalar radar or directed energy weapon with technology they got from the Germans who got it from ET, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you can bring them down. I think that's what the 509th Bomb Squadron of B-29s had in Roswell. Oh, well, they had the, the radar. Uh, they had scalar radar? Yeah, the Kleistron, the Kleistron brothers, Sigrud and whatever their names were, uh, they worked for the MIT Rad Lab with Vannevar Bush, John G. Trump, and a cast of physicists during the war. And they, the Germans were trying to work on it too, but they found that, yes, radar is scalar waves, but if you can amp up the power and change the frequency... You take shit out of the sky. You can take shit out of the sky. Yeah. Uh, and someone said, hey, radar, you know, and we <laughs> used it in microwave ovens, you know, and I think all, the, you know, those people were right. It's the, it tears apart the nutrition and food when you nuke stuff. Um, you know, I'm a military person said, oh, my God, don't use, don't use the damn microwave oven. We use that as a weapon. <laughs> Everybody in America's got a weapon in their kitchen right now. I was like, in the 90s, I was nuking everything with, you know, that's what we say. We nuked it. In the mm -hmm. And he yeah, said, yeah, don't yeah. use that shit. That's electromagnetic scalar wave weapons, directed energy weapon. Wow. Like, shit. Oh, <laughs> up a microwave. Well, <laughs> always keep a microwave so you can put your cell phone in it because that's a Faraday cage. Yeah, uh, it is. <laughs> Common intel. Nice. Intel community <laughs> trick. And my wife, she's like, don't throw the microwave. I have to put my phone in there. <laughs> it's a Faraday cage. <laughs> it is. You can put your car keys, the little fobs too, the yeah. same deal. You throw your car key fobs in there. So they don't. And everyone's put... like, oh, they're tracking me through my cell phone. And it's like, um, they don't need your cell phone. No. Every human body is an electrical system, you know, our chakras and everything. Uh, it's the military is an acronym for your aura. Mm -hmm. It's bio. I sent it to you in that page of notes. Yeah, yeah. Bioluminescent electromagnetic intelligence field. Belief. <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The military loves their acronyms. Yeah, they do. You know, and it, and so it's you can track you by that signature because everyone has a distinct frequency. Every living thing in the in the universe and the cosmos has a distinctive frequency, and you can track that. Mm. Gee whiz, I wonder who taught them that. <laughs> the Nazis and the aliens. The Germans. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah. I mean, a lot of that data did come from Germany, but they didn't perfect a lot of this stuff. It was on paper. Look, as a little girl. Uh, the, the Delta Wing supersonic fighters we had in the 50s, that was all based on German designs. You know, it's, it's not... Once you're over the hump of disbelief, it's not hard to figure out that was so much cross pollinization going on. And mm -hmm. I believe uh, William Tompkins in the stuff in his book. And it's because my dad and I did a FOIA request. He mentions Admiral Rico Boda, who was an Australian immigrant to the United States, became an admiral. And he, one photograph we have of him is on a naval aviation uh, tribute site. And so mm -hmm. when my dad did a FOIA request on Rico Boda, he had the photo. They said, oh, we don't have anything. And he's like, God damn it, I'm staring at a photo. And the, finally, they gave him the information that was on the website. And I said, Dad, this guy has been scrubbed from naval history. And he's like, you're right. This is a non-person as far as we're concerned. Now, William Tonkman's also prints a, a photo somewhere of these admirals. And my O and I friend said, I recognize two admirals in that group photo. Those guys would not be involved with some sort of bullshit book. If that they if they support William Tompkins, then he knows what he's writing about. Mm, wow! Oh, so I'll let that. That's what I know. Uh, I, I believe William Tompkins. I think it's some harsh uh, history to swallow. Yeah. Um, but it makes sense to me, given the amount sheer amount of secrecy going on. I mean, and that's why they're doing this Lou Elizondo, Chris Mellon tag team dog and pony show. It's because people are waking up too fast. You know, the great awakening. The internet is, is full of crazy people like us telling <laughs> the truth you know, or, or something close to it. And someone in the Pentagon and the IC and, the, and, and in that corporate military industrial complex, corporate Intel said, look, we need to slow this down. We need to announce it publicly. We don't know what these things are. It's a mystery, which is a lie. 
Mm. And the Navy, I, the Navy has my my guys like, oh my God, we got we have charts of all these different kinds of UFOs, and we know what, who most of them are flying them and where they're from. So you know, this That's is a amazing. Navy captain, a retired Navy captain, telling me this. You know, he's my best friend from childhood. You know, it's 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 a joke around D.C. Oh, you know, they're always working with you know, Anunnaki in the Pentagon. It's a joke. Wow. And everyone else is like, gosh, I don't know what the truth is. It's like, God, you know, I've grown up here and it's the cognitive dissonance is, is just palpable. It's as thick as Krupp steel on a, on a battleship Bismarck. Yeah, man. It's unbelievable. This is a joke. You get NSA and CIA with a cocktail party in my apartment a couple of years back. This is a joke. Half of them didn't believe it at all. And the other half were like, you idiots. What are you talking about? Know, just because you didn't have the clearance that I did. Wow. This is so, so some people that were living with, you know, as soon as you get that clearance, you suddenly, your knowledge of the world is going to change. It's going to probably affect how you see everything, yeah? Well, yeah, that's what like, they always say, like, you're the presidential gray, you know, even though the president doesn't know, you know, much. But, I mean, you know, you see the president after he comes out of the office, it's like, you know, it's like they turn into me, right? You get gray on the sides. It's like, yeah, you know, you'll go bomb. You seen Obama when he first came into office, and then like a year later, he's like, everything's gray. It's like you learn all these things that are just mind blowing. And I've heard Warner, and this is you know maybe two sources that I've heard this from, but that there's like the Navy side that is like maybe aligned with a certain group of off world intelligence, and then there's maybe the Army and you know the other branches that are that are you know, aligned with another branch of intelligence and that they don't get along so well sometimes that there's some infighting between the, well, the branches of military and these other entities that they just don't like each other and they fight at times for some of this shit. Well, the Navy, Air Force and Army have always fought bitterly since time immemorial. Since they all the hate each other. The Marines, they all, they all, they all just want to fist fight in every bar all across the world, right? They're just... They're <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense to me that there, there are so many factions. You know, Chris Mellon and Lou Elizondo and Hal Putoff and Jim Semivan and those people, they represent a group of factions. The Navy is another group of factions. It, it's very confusing. Mm -hmm. I know they're infighting. I've been told that right. by several sources. They infight all the time. Right. It would make sense that they, they would have been aligned with certain ET groups, both positive and negative, <clears throat> they different. Mm -hmm. People forget there's people out in the universe it's just like the world here is as above, so below. Mm -hmm. That's the same. Yeah. There's some people that are like, yeah, you guys are okay. I'll do, I'll do business with anyone. You know, there's a lot of people that are just indifferent. Right. It's yeah, like, yeah. hey, we make this deal with us. We need to build a new spaceship, and they're like, sure, mm -hmm. but we're also going to sell it to the bad guys. We don't care. It's it's just like, you go to a black market anywhere in the world, that's a real black market. You know, dark web stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What are they? What can you get there? Everything. Have enough gold. Anything you want. Right. Yeah, Why yeah. is it any different? At least I've been told, you know, the lower half of the fourth dimension and third dimension people in our galaxy are dealing in a, in a, in a black market. It makes sense. Right. Once you're above in the higher fourth dimension, you're, you're, you're vibrating too high. You're too positive. It's like you don't need to deal with the black market. Right. You yeah. can pretty much manifest what you want and, deal with people to get something done and, and you just don't you purge a lot of that negativity um, that's the word you know, on the street but you know well, it, it just makes sense yeah i mean like you know the idea like of contact you know in terms of like you know the idea that you say there's anarchy walking the corridors of the pentagon or whatever um i keep thinking about like the, the german stuff again you know like, when they were making contact the idea yeah, that, that was all psychic until they'd maybe made the craft. And then if you followed the legend, maybe they actually then went off planet. Mm -hmm. but all contact being psychic prior to that. I mean, and that element comes in loads with lots of different types of characters, like with Tesla, for example. Mm -hmm. um, Von, Braun, Von Braun mentioned it. Townsend, um, T yeah, Brown. All those and then guys. now you've got the modern stuff, like you've got Tim Taylor, who is sort of saying that's what he does. You know, the idea you wake up in the morning, you meditate and you then come out of a new invention or you know is that contact i mean is is it physical or is it mental i mean are there, are there anunnaki walking down the corridor just human beings who have got a better psychic link or are they physically different 
Oh, I mean, look at our history. I mean, the extended skull, oblong skull, people of Peru. I mean, it's obvious that we've had probably several different kinds of human races all throughout our history mingling, uh, mm -hmm. and some with a lot more intelligence and psychic power. And this mm -hmm. is that there's a theory of what's called Homo Capensis, hmm. which is the elongated skull people mating with the Anunnaki royal bloodlines of Europe. And I don't know how long ago, but a very long time ago, probably maybe before the Great Flood and even after. Mm. But I mean, I, you know, there are psychics, you know, the, <laughs> in the military and CIA hires them in droves. Yeah. To be remote viewers and remote assassins. Right. And I'm sorry, the, the Russians had a psychic army mm -hmm. in World War II. You know, leave it to the Russians. <laughs> Let us have a whole battalion of psychics. <laughs> and they, they had the millions of people to screen and bring those people fight for the motherland and you know who wouldn't and some of that came it came out after you know the the cold war i mean there was a lot of uh, photos and videos of you know uh, uh pk so people like there was i can't remember the, yeah. the lady's name she was just you know manipulating oh, all kinds amazing. of stuff. yeah well, like videos of him and whether it was real or not but yeah moving stuff across the you know the table and, and things like that and you know We've heard that China is doing the same thing. That China has a giant program where they they have kids that can pull notes out of sealed jars and slide them across the room at people. And there's videos and stuff like that. You know, I'm sure they can do much more than that. Right. Um, you know, everyone on Earth, all humans have the ability to be psychic. That's what your sixth sense. You know, mm -hmm. women have intuition. Well, that's because women are slightly higher vibrating than than men are. Mazel tov. Yeah, muscle oh. ladies out there. <laughs> you have, that's you know the divine feminine. You know, you have a creational the ka, the creational power of the cosmos in you. Yeah. And men are just sort of window dressing. We're sort of here to fight wars and <laughs> drag race. Or Talk on podcasts about you. <laughs> <laughs> drag yeah, race, here, right? <laughs> but you know, women are super important, and that's why we have glass ceilings. And the church is abused women druids and all this. But Terrible. Going back to the Germans. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I think happens is uh, they had, I think real society was definitely real. It, it had predated going back to the Lords of the Black Stone in the 19th century, which were Templars and, right. you know, people that wanted a united Germany and maybe expand the German empire for the good of the Reich. And the real society was the spiritual component of that. You know, well, wait a minute, you know, we can have this anti-gravity free energy for all. Right. And by the way, we found this really nice guy, Hitler, and he's going to really be our messiah. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we overthought that one, didn't we? Oops, we kind of right. let that so one they were, they were They were in psychic contact, but so were we in the British, but probably to a smaller level. Mm -hmm. The Germans, Prussians and the Germans, they lobbed, they, they really caught on to this, um, you know, Vedic science, alchemy, uh, you know, philosopher science philosophers, philosopher scientists like, way before anyone else. Um, they're very good, obviously, engineers, and they have a lot of proficiency in technical schools. And so, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with people, and this is why I'm, I'm worried about Greer's CE5, you know, it's a beautiful spiritual experience and a light show. It's right. too expensive, you know, but whatever. Everything fun costs money. And, uh, <laughs> um, but you might get some baddies. Yeah. And I think what happened was the real society, the Tula society and the Nazi party somewhere in the twenties, you know, Hitler started to really bring it all together. Uh, everyone say, Oh, Hitler wasn't into the cult. Nah, that's a lie. The reason he was a vegetarian was because of Lord Bulwar Lytton's book on the coming race. The right. real ya. I mm -hmm. put that in lion, tiger, bear. Yeah. I and mean, that's why he and Himmler were vegetarians. So bullshit on that. Uh, I think the Germans, you know, the word was the flying saucers and, and alien craft and have been, you know, maybe even coming back in time from the future, you know, our own stuff, mm -hmm. time travel, that gets mind bending in it. But we have to accept that that's part of space, space travel. Mm -hmm. And so people are trying to influence history. You've got ETs coming that are benevolent and everything in between and regressive. And the Germans, you know, the Nazi party had brought, I think they, they, had strict rules for the Tula and Vril Society. And I believe there was a Vril propulsion workshop. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I write about that. I explain it all in, in, in detail. And they were like, 
we're going to go with these guys who say they can help us with weapons. Because the story is Maria Orsic was channeling some nice people from the Aldebaran star system. They were like, free energy, you can get off coal and oil and you know, gas and chemicals and do all of that. And they were like, nah. I mean, Germany, <laughs> Germany wanted to get off. <laughs> Germany in the late 30s, they didn't have a lot of resources. They had to buy oil and coal. I mean, they right. had coal. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they synthesized fuel from coal, but it was expensive and it took a lot of electricity. So yeah. the Nazi Bell plasma accelerators would have been the ideal choice. They would have been able to purify all the gasoline they wanted from coal fuel or synthetic fuel right. if they had zero point energy. Now, they were working on it and I, I think they didn't get perfected until, you know, if, if, the, if the Antarctica stories are true, Mm. There's something to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, my God, there's so many military bases down there. America's got like a hundred. I'm not I mean, kidding you. I mean, if, if zero point energy exists now, if, if it's there, the technology to do it, um, and they don't, it's the biggest crime ever, isn't it? As we watch like the planet suffer and people across oil, the world like oil fields burning and oil spills all over the yeah, oceans everywhere. The yeah. Of the Iraq war with the F 15. Oh, my God, it was apocalyptic. Yeah. But going back to the German point, I think they had psychic and physical interaction mm. with ETs okay. and other intelligences. So it was a mixture because, you know, some blonde people, you know, come in and say, hey, how you doing? They speak perfect German. They're like, we'll help you with this if you'll, you know, make a deal with us for certain things that we want. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the Nazi party and the tool society, which was under strict you know, on an airbay SS, they were under strict supervision by the SS. Strict. What? What's the, and what's they the did what they were told. Uh, I'm sure. But what? Uh, what choice did they have? None. Yeah. Uh, none. People are like, "Oh, why did they?" You know, and it's like you don't understand a, a serious Nazi. People only know what they see in movies, and they don't do any research. And it's right. like, my God, you know, if you say on an airbay SS, no one knows what that means. You have to say, look at the first Indiana Jones movie. Those Germans should have been wearing SS patches right? because yeah, yeah. they would have been on an airbay SS. They made them regular Germans. I understand Spielberg did that probably, you know, for, to clean it up a little bit for you know, a family audience, but mm -hmm. they would have been SS, mm -hmm. but they did show them being fairly ruthless. Oh and, yeah. You know, the regular German army wasn't the SS. There's a big distinction. Yeah. The regular German army had been like my dumbass. Like I have to go. I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah it's so not the same thing. Every, every military force has blood on its hands. In mm -hmm. The Americans, you know, we're not this altruistic, you know, the Americans, no. a lot of people in prison camps and made them starve. You know, there was rape and injustice on all, on all fronts. It's part of war, which is sad and, and grim. And I hate it. But, you know, you can't lay the blame on the Germans and the, and the Nazis and the SS alone. No. The Russians, they told their soldiers to go rape and pillage. Ah, this is terrible. Ordered, they it's, ordered them to do so. Wow. Well, it's, and who can blame them? They were so angry. For, but there's a lot of evidence that Stalin was purchased, you know, had his tanks and troops for an invasion of Europe in 41. There's a theory that Hitler invaded on the solstice, June 21st, mm -hmm. not only for occult reasons, <coughs> <clears throat> but because Stalin was going to invade Europe on the on the twenty second. Wow! All right now, no one's been able to prove that, but the Soviets were on an offensive footing, which leaves them vulnerable to attack. True, and that gets into uh, military details and tank placements and troop movements. But um, if that story is true, then <laughs> horribly we have to say, well, Hitler tried to save Europe. You know? <laughs> On top of his psychopathic crimes, or his own ass. I mean, you can put it that way too. Well, You're trying to save his own ass, he yeah. Did it for the German people because he yeah. wanted, you know, obviously. But yeah, he didn't give a shit about anybody behind him. <laughs> <It was> there, just, <laughs> yeah, there may be some truth in that. Yeah. Well, but everything is muddled. Uh, in history, like the twenty-seven or the thirty million, it's like they tell you that, and they're like, "Well, how did they kill that many Russians?" Mm. Uh, well move on to the next chapter. You know, they don't even teach that in school. I asked questions in school and college and the teacher's like, we're not covering that. I said, why not? Cause we don't wait. I don't know. Cause they're they're, like, they're, we don't know. 
Wait One guy dropped me from his history class. What? Yeah, he said you're asking too many questions off topic. You're you're you know. Then I want to double my money back. <laughs> hey, look here, asshole. I want to do your job. You can leave, and I'll I'll do your job. You guys were probably the same. Everyone who's yeah. a seeker or a UFO enthusiast, they've always asked questions. They're like, wait a minute. This doesn't yeah. make sense. They're like, leave the classroom. You know, oh, God. You know, I, I, remember, school, I, I was sent to the principal who was a priest. You know, Oh, gee. God hates you, John Warner. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's just going to bare knuckle you to the floor. I want a t-shirt that says, God hates you, John Warner. <laughs> <laughs> just want to wear that. One. <laughs> they really said that in private because they, they, oh. they said I said Jesus. Jesus was a used car salesman. <laughs> <laughs> and a shitty. There's one. another T-shirt. There's another T-shirt. You got T-shirt well, got days. The fifth grade, and I got <laughs> Jesus was a shitty car salesman. Oh, <laughs> the John Warner T-shirt factory is out. Jesus was now, a shitty used car salesman, and God hates you, John Warner. <laughs> but let's talk T-shirt. symbolism, if, if you don't mind, for one minute. Oh yeah. The cross, the Christian cross, predates Christianity. It does. Like, I don't know, 100,000 years? I don't know. It was mm-hmm. a symbol of resurrection or reincarnation. Yep. Now, why would a peaceful religion have a man on a cross being tortured to death? Well, why would we have a swastika that also, and- the swastika was predated uh, Tibetan, I mean, forever, right? I mean, uh, J- Jimmy Paul M and I talked about that in my last interview, and it's like, it's it's been the peaceful forever, um, and he broke it down to me, because he's a master of symbology. Well, he, yeah, it's like the northern, it's it's the the pole star, and it's it's the, um, uh, oh, come on, uh, it's the, yeah, the Big Dipper, <laughs> basically, re- revolving around the pole star. Well, and, it, it's more than that. I explained it in Little Anton. Uh, the Vril Society chose it because it's they reversed it so that it, oh. that it meant, you know, this it's the spiral torsion twisting force of energy, the universe, the galaxies all spin. Everything is spin. Right. Torsion, so yeah. this is forward momentum into a brighter future. Uh, it didn't work out that way. <laughs> Oops, we messed that up. Everybody scrubbed but that if, off. But if the stories of Germans on the nearest star system colonies are true. You know, I've heard they still use the swastika, but they, they don't like anything to do with Hitler or the Nazi party. That's the, the, the story. And if it is true, they're still using that symbol, but they've made it, you know, but it's still on an eagle. And come on, you're splitting atoms. 